So who are you? My name is Lisa Joy Rosner. I'm the CMO of a company called NetBase. I've been in this valley for almost 20 years. I started off as a data warehousing expert, a lot of business intelligence. I worked for a company called Brio through the IPO process. And then I traded that in for getting into the e-commerce market. I've been there for a long time. I was the CMO at Broad Vision and most recently uh, launched and grew a company called MyBuys. So what, what's really interesting, because we, we were talking before the cameras turned on about um, NetBase and, and where it came from. So give me a, a sense of the history because the I, history. I found that was very interesting. Okay. Well, so NetBase was founded by um, two guys from Ariba, a man named Jonathan Spear and Michael Osofsky. They were engineers at Ariba. Um, both of them went their separate ways after Ariba. One went to Harvard to get an MBA and the other went to MIT to get an MBA with a focus on innovation. And together they decided to start this company called NetBase, which um, at its heart was about really un teaching the computer to read and understand the English language. Diagramming sentences just like you did you know, in 10th grade or 8th grade, depending on where you went to school. And getting at not just basic semantic, but true natural language understanding. And the first application of this product of this infrastructure was building a product for a company called Reed Elsevier, which is the largest publisher in the world. And they've been in business since the 1600s, actually. Yeah. And they have science, technology, and medical content that they're looking, always looking for different ways to monetize. And we're talking about you know, hundreds and thousands of, of exabytes of data. And what we did was build an application for them called Illuminate. The Illuminate was designed for the scientific researcher. On top of the technology, we have these things called lenses. And the lenses help facilitate um, different types of insight discovery. So for a scientist, it's what are the practical uses of a chemical like benzochloratine or photovoltaic cells or you know, different, other different you know, types of chemicals or scientific things. Who are the organizations that use these chemicals? Um, all different types of lenses like that that help a scientist with their research process. Yep. So what happened was a group of research scientists were using Illuminate at Procter & Gamble in the Pantene division, in the Olay division, in the Gillette division, doing things like finding ways to create luster in hair or sparkle in eyeshadow or... Um, so they were searching for chemicals or searching for... They were looking, they were searching for patents, for organizations, for uses of chemicals, for applications of chemicals all different ways to, to drive the innovation at the, at the fundamental product level, really like all the way down to the DNA of a product. Um, and what happened was they were literally collapsing the design process, uh, the design and the execution process for, for different products. This is in foodstuffs and in different you know, health and beauty aids, that kind of thing. What happened was the head of all global insights at Procter & Gamble, a woman named Kim Dediger, somehow saw this product. She was, I, I don't know, talking to a scientist, saw this product, saw the power of the lenses and the power of this actual nat natural language understanding. Picked up the phone and called NetBase and said, I want this. And so what, what, would, a, what would a product person use your system for? What, what could they gain from it that they couldn't gain just by watching TweetDeck or Seismic or you know, or doing some basic searches with uh, well, I'll give you some examples. or something like that. So this is not a customer of ours, but a, a deep case study that we did, um, Listerine. Yeah. Okay, it's a product, most people have Listerine or, or one of their competitors. I'm a, a brand manager at Listerine and I want to understand why people like my product, how they're using it. So you go into consumer base, run a query on Listerine, uh, and the way that the, the system is designed is to answer questions. What, are the, what do people like and dislike? And you can look at it in a word, word cloud and then drill down or in pie chart. So what do people like about it? Well, interesting things. I bet you didn't know that it kills to toenail fungus. No. And it repels mosquitoes. And it helps you deal with dandruff and athlete's foot. They also like it because it kills germs, which is part of their messaging. And some people like it because it reminds them of their grandpa. So I'm a brand manager and I'm trying to decide 
how should I message this product? I need to start giving information to, to advertising for a creative campaign. Reminds me of grandpa, I can see a whole campaign unfold from that. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm looking to do a brand extension. How, what else should I be doing with my brand? You mentioned that your system's studying blogs and it studies Twitter and Facebook? Everything, or? we read the whole web. The whole, so you have spiders going everywhere, everywhere. that brings this data mm -hmm. back and your system then indexes it and crunches mm -hmm. exactly. it and looks at, it's not sentiment, right? Because it's, it's not, not sentiment. Sentiment tells you thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, positive, negative, neutral. And it's, and it's not always right. But what, what social media understanding, what this natural language processing does, is really help you understand the emotions, the passion, the level of involvement, the, the motivations, the why. Okay. Does sentiment tell you that Listerine reminds me of grandpa? No, it's just, you know, in fact, you can say, hmm, I hate the way it smells, but it reminds me of grandpa. A sentence like that, would end up being flagged as negative sentiment. But reminds me of ground testing that we'd surface as a positive okay. because we understand. Now give, give me a, you said you'd studied retailers and our passion about different kinds right. of grocery stores yeah. and grocery retailers. Tell me sort of what the system would show me if I was doing research on Costco and Walmart and Safeway and stuff like that. So we just we just launched this fun campaign called the, the NetBase Brand Passion Index. And it's it's every month we go out and we study different brands and understand we look at the combination of the sentiment, how much chatter and you know where it falls and just the positive and negative, but really what we look at is we measure the passion and the emotional involvement. So we look at what people are saying and why. And we look at instances of love. And here's a funny story to show, to show that the, the, the passion index works. I've been looking at all kinds of brands. Um, and one of the brands that I looked at is Comcast. You know, what, do you, yeah. what kind of passion score do you think Comcast gets? Well, uh, according to uh, somebody at a conference this morning, that everybody hates the Comcast. They hate it. But there's something interesting about Comcast. There's a product manager who works there. Yeah. And his name is Randy Love. Huh. And he's a very avid writer. He's published all over the internet. So guess what that means? There are a lot of sentences out there that say love and Comcast. In fact, we ran a query on a few, you can download the listening tools, and found a lot of positive statements because Randy Love said blah, 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 Comcast. They have a hate bubble this big <laughs> in consumer base. Yeah. because we know that Randy Love is a person because we diagram the sentences and read the language and completely discount all of those. Yeah. So when someone says, I hate Comcast or I hate, I hate Comcast because their service sucks, we read and surface that. You know, why do people hate it? Service sucks. Yeah. Right? But in terms of building the passion index, they, they had a zero love score because there's just no chatter pertaining to the, the, uh, the emotional involvement of love. Right. despite Randy Love. But what, what you were asking about is um, the passion index around retailers. So we just looked at a whole bunch of retailers to check um, what the passion level is for them. Yeah. And, and passion can be both positive and negative, right? Yeah. I mean, you can let, high passion is love or hate. Yeah. And, and the retailers, when they have one or the other, tend to have a loyal following and, and tend to really have their customers where they want them. And then when you're on the other side in the like or the dislike, quite interestingly, there is, are hardly any brands in the dislike category. Because if you dislike a brand, you just kind of dislike it, you can go somewhere else. Yeah. If you hate it, but you're still there, it's, it's because they've got you as a hostage. So we looked at a bunch of retailers. Um, we did it right in time for Memorial Day. We looked at where people go to shop their, you know, for their burgers and watermelon and beer, that kind of thing. And the highest off the chart hate score was Walmart. And do you remember who was the most love? Uh, Costco. I've, I've Lots of toilet paper. We love buying toilet paper in bulk. Consumers <laughs> love Costco. And they talk about it. They also, and, so, and they talk about it a lot. So the highest love score was Costco because there was a lot of chatter, so their bubble was big, but there was a lot of love chatter, which put them off the chart. Yeah. The next in line was what I call whole paycheck. Yeah. See, I love Whole Foods, yeah. but they're very expensive. Yeah. 
So their love score was a little lower um, because people do love them, but there is that one little caveat. And I also think that not there's a certain personality that spends a lot of time online talking. Yeah. And I think that people who have time and money to shop at Whole Foods don't always have the time to blog. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, a diss. This is my personal opinion. Um, no, it's not so a diss. So you can feed Steve Jobs good talking <laughs> points for his next speech. You know? Well, you know, actually, we just, we just ran um, a bunch of searches on the iPad, which have been really fun. We've been looking at all different, all different facets of what people love and not love about the iPad. They, what they hate is that it doesn't, it's not compatible with Flash. Yeah. People are, they're really verbal about that. Um, one of the other things that we can do, and this kind of ties into the passion index, is that we can look at more pref preferred over or less preferred to. So when you look at the iPad, and we have this chart that says, you know, show me the brands that are more, more preferred to yeah. the iPad or, or the iPad is preferred more than. So the iPad is preferred a lot, like 78% more than the Kindle, which I thought was really interesting. Oh, yeah. um, more preferred than your standard notebook, more preferred than the iPhone. Yep. So what this does is really helps the brand manager understand how is my brand, you know, how does it compare vis-a-vis -vis my com competition? Yeah. And what's the, and then you can drill into understanding the passion level. So. Is, are any executives using your tool yet? Because I was just thinking, Steve Jobs could really use this to know what the talking points that he should be poking at. You know, what's going to win with uh, the audience well, and what's not going to win with the audience. Well, and it's interesting that you bring that up because there are three different kinds of things that you can get out of consumer base. The first thing we call it a confirmational insight, right? That goes back to what you were saying. Yeah. So the Wii, we did a whole bunch of searches on the, the you know, the, the Nintendo Wii. So. Confirmational insight. Why do people love the Wii? They love it for fitness. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm a brand manager or I'm a market researcher. I already know that. I mean, it was designed to get people, the couch potatoes, off the couch, yeah. but still in front of their TV. Yeah. So, but I, so that's something that, that's, that you know, confirms what I know. But when, when you look down at some of the verbatims, they're actually fitness centers that are, are being designed with Wii sections. Wow. Uh, well, and actually, that, that's more of an intensity insight, but people are using it to exercise with their kids and exercise with their dogs and exercise with their babies. Yeah. There's like a whole, there's a whole subcategory in fitness that helps us understand, yes, people confirm that they like fitness, but we're looking at the different applications and the words that people use. So, right. so like you said, you know, you could go back and say, okay, well, I already know that they like fitness, but here are the words they use and the places they go and the people that they engage with. Tell me something surprising you learned by do doing that. Well, with so, the Wii. well so, so that, that's the confirmational. Then there's also the intensity insight, which, you know, again, you can find out how much people love it and, 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 and from there really develop campaigns. But then comes that needle in the haystack, the bona fide new insight. So when we're looking at the practical uses, you know, the likes and dislikes of the Wii, all of a sudden there's this slice of the, on, the, on the pie that says stroke injury. And the first time I looked at it, I was like, how is that a like of the Wii? Well, it turns out, you know, you drill down, read some of the verbatims, it's called Wiihab. So the Wii, the, because of, you know, the repetitive motion, yeah. is actually a great rehabilitation tool for any kind of brain trauma, particularly stroke. Wow. So there are all these little um, rehab centers that are using the Wii with these octogenarians, helping them regain their mobility after a stroke. Wow. And that's a new insight. And you know, again, that, that, and that's an actionable insight. I mean, think of all the possibilities that we could do with that. And maybe they know, maybe they don't. Just the fact that they call it WeHab is kind of funny. But they can, use rehabilitation centers as a major channel of distribution. They can do educational campaigns on stroke awareness. They can donate money to stroke camp. I mean, there's all kinds of things they can do. They can innovate new now, special applications. Now, uh, is NetBase only, is only is it only for big brands or could a small no. little yogurt well, shop in Palo Alto use it to learn about their customers? Um, I think to some extent they can. The, the product, I mean, if people are talking, we're listening and understanding to what, what they're saying. Yeah. So if you want to understand what consumers like about yogurt, right, so and understand that cauliflower yogurt is not a good idea, 
but maybe you know bubblegum m M&M m yogurt is a good idea um, they may there may be a limited amount of chatter about that tiny corner store, but if you're looking at the bigger picture more strategically. Right, but can, can a small store afford it? That's where Absolutely. I and so what's the pricing model so, for it? So we're designed to sell, we're okay. designed to grow, and um, our pricing is really fabulous. It's $250 a user a month. Okay. So. And where do we learn more about it? www.netbase.com, that's N-E-T-B-A-S-E. And can we see, where can we learn about some of the brand studies that you were talking about? We do blog a little bit about it. Um, we just had our first uh, public case study published, and it's actually in the pharmaceutical space, okay. which is interesting. And I'll be blogging about that pretty soon. Um, and we're going to be, be launching a bunch of new stories as they come in. One of the challenges of working with these gigantic companies is that getting permission to tell their stories takes a long time. Absolutely. But um, I'm, Which is why we were careful not to That's mention. right. So. But I'm Lisa Joy Rosner. I'm, I'm L Rosner at netbase.com. That's L-R-O-S-N-E-R at netbase.com. And I got all the stories up here, and I'd be happy to share them. Very cool. Thank you so, so thank much you for so much. coming on my it's show. It's a pleasure.